Good morning. Can we start in prayer, please? If you guys wouldn't mind joining me. God, we just come to you right now and just thank you for today. Uh, we thank you for this opportunity to be in your presence. We thank you for the words that you prepared for today. We just uh, thank you for preparing our hearts. I pray that as we gather right now and we speak and we have community together and we gather, God, and, and we just get to uh, be in your presence, that you would touch our hearts. Help us to continue to come back to being the people that you created us to be. Thank you so much for this church community. Thank you for all the work you're doing through us. We celebrate you in your name. Amen. Amen. Shake it off. You know what I mean? Shake it off. Ooh, I got to do that sometimes. You know, sometimes, you know, it's, I, I don't know if anybody here has anxiety issues like I do. But, you know, it's always like you're thinking about it. It's going to be this. This is going to happen. That's going to happen. And then you show up and everything falls apart. And you're like, that's exactly what I was worried about. And then you just realize God was saying turn right because I had a plan. And that wasn't what we're supposed to be doing today. So here we go. We're about to do what God has planned for today. Y'all with that? Amen. All right. Let's do that. So um, the next couple of weeks, we're going to be talking about the fifth priority. So we've been going through recapping what we did in our vision week. Um, we talked about the five priorities, and that first one, I just want to recap those real quick. Um, these are what we came up with a few years back as we were thinking about how to, how to last through this season. You know, this has not been a season of growth. This has been a season of trying to rebuild, right? Trying to establish, right? Trying to rebuild this community, bring us back into the building. I mean, like we're all sitting in the room right now, right? Do you guys remember when that wasn't the case, right? And I think a lot of what we were lacking is what we've been working on in these five priorities, and what we were lacking was that community. So priority one was to continue to become a faith community that takes the work of discipleship seriously and makes it central to our life together with a focus on faithfulness and obedience to Jesus. Priority two, continue the struggle to become a multicultural, anti-racist faith community. Priority three, Create shareable, powerful, impactful content on a regular basis. Create a prophetic imagination and a movement of shalom within our, with our content. <clears throat> Priority four, continue to create a faith family culture of service to one another and to our community. And then priority five, which is what we're going to be talking about today, is providing good humanizing housing for those in need within our community. Well, we've been spending time as a pastoral team, and I'm talking about pastoral team, our finance committee, our session. We've been digging, folks. We've been digging, fam. Really digging to see what these priorities meant for us and to help us really kind of like operationalize and try to figure out what does that mean in like our day to day. And on this, on this um, fifth priority, providing good humanizing housing for those in need within our community, I want to be clear, like when it was originally made, this idea was actually about like building houses, like building like physical community. And church, you've done that. I mean, there's six tiny homes at this address. I don't know if you guys know, there's still 2490 A, B, C, D, E, A, B, C, D, e, F. <clears throat> I got it. I nailed it. I didn't have to take my shoes off. My wife is so proud of me right now. But that's, that was the original idea, right? Was that we not, it's, you know, it's a Band-Aid, right? To be able to just give one item to somebody, right? Pastor Jake, when, when the original vision came around, we were giving out meals and then somebody came in the rain and he was able to give them a blanket or a jacket. And then he said, what else could we do, right? Ultimately, the solution is building houses for people that don't have houses, am I right? But it's so much more than that. And today we're going to dig a little bit into that because we're going to talk about what does it mean to be homeless, okay? What does it mean to be unhoused without a home? And I, if, it, if it's all right with you guys, I want to have a little bit of creative license. And if I can expand the view a little bit, are you guys okay with that? If I take a little bit of, I got some elders right here. Is it okay if I, okay, he, he gave me the nod. <clears throat> I'm okay. If the, if, that, if the cane comes out, you guys let me know that I got to get off the stage. But we serve those who are struggling to find a physical home through our community outreach division. What about the rest of the work that we do? I don't want to trivialize just, just folks that are dealing with the housing issue. 
But I want to point out the fact that it is much larger than just a housing issue, although it is a housing issue. But each one of us in all of our ministries are dealing with people that are unhoused in one way, shape, or form. If we zoom out and think about all the communities that First Pres as their home, um, serves as their home, we'll be able to see this concept of home at work from every single ministry. Let's look at that good humanizing housing part. We, we talked about the tiny homes, the tiny homes that have been built here. Fam, they have a bathroom. They have a stovetop. They have a refrigerator. They have a space for people to lay down and sleep. And I don't know if you want, anybody here has ever been just going really hard for a long time where you just haven't had a break. But what we find is most of the time when people get into the tiny homes, they just sleep for a long time. They rest. I've actually, um, I, there was a brother of mine that was in the tiny homes that I lived in. Uh, my family and I lived in that village in Livermore. And a brother told me, he came up to me and he says, 3 a.m. And I was like, I don't know what that means. <laughs> he just said 3 a.m., no context. He's like, that's what time I took a shower because I could. It wasn't during our programming or our timing, and it was probably the longest shower of his life, right? But that's the humanizing housing part of it. We still mean that, and we're still working on creating humanizing housing, so I'm not trying to step away from that. I'm just adding to it. We're going a layer deeper, if you're still with me. But what about that people in need part? Who's in need in this community? What definition are we using of community? We ask ourselves, you know, I know uh, in the past we used to have um, a parish type leadership, right, where people would be over a geographic area. Is it is a de demographic question? We have a lot of things to consider of who the people in need are that we're here to serve. But I've had the pleasure of getting to know a lot of you. And one of the things that I've got to know from each one of you, church, is that you each have different gifts. Different people groups are on your heart different age groups, different things that you can serve, right? I mean, I'm looking here, I would, I would list all of them. I'm, I'm seeing each one of you and how you've come to me and say, how can I help? How can I help? I do this. Can I do that? Can I do this? Can I do that? And in Romans 12, it tells us, verse 6 through 8, it says, we have different gifts according to the grace given each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it's serving, then serve. If it's teaching, then teach. If it's to encourage, then give encouragement. If it's giving, then give generously. And we accept all gifts. Just put it out there. <laughs> Sorry, that was a joke. All right. If it's to lead, do it diligently. If it's to show mercy, do it cheerfully. So let's use those gifts as we dig into this last priority, fam. I challenge you each to think about what your gifting is and how you have been and can continue to create home for those struggling to find home in this community. Um, there's a book called um, Beyond Homelessness, and it's a study of faith groups and homelessness, like little homelessness. And um, it goes through and it talks about a lot of the different elements, what it is that causes this issue, um, what are some solutions. Um, and digging into that, they came up with what they call the eight marks of home. A couple years ago, I was, I was blessed to go um, actually with Jake to um, Austin, Texas, to Community First Village. And they taught, um, I got to stay there for a whole week, and they taught us about the eight marks of home. Today, we're going to dig into the first four of those, and I want us to really kind of just think about it. What are the ways that we are creating home here in this community with all of the ministries that we're each involved with? In the first one, it says in the book that to be at home somewhere is more than simply having a place to stay. We sometimes stay in motels or hotels, perhaps even for relatively long periods of time, but we typically do not consider or call such places home. And why is that? Because the first, part, the first mark of a home is that a home is a place of permanence, a place of familiarity. We're always a guest in a motel, right? It's not ours, right? It's not necessarily a place that we can continue to come back to but those of us that have home, we have that permanence, a place that we can go back to. Home signifies spatial permanence, an enduring presence or a residence. I mean, what are some of those signs that we have, right? You get mail to your home. Anybody here ever moved and you still get mail to your old home? Has that ever been a problem? Is, am I the only one? 
Okay, that happens, right? But what about for those that don't have an address? Right, what are those that don't have an address? You're not able to receive those things that require you to have an address, right? It is a challenge. When I was sitting here thinking about this, I was thinking about, what about for our little kids? What do we do to create home? For our little babies, right? We've got His Growing Grove, our daycare here. We got First Pres Kids. One of the things that we do that is we have consistent staffing and volunteers. We have people that consistently spend time with the young children, loving on kids, calling kids by their names, right? Not, hey kid, oh, they're so cute, but actually having a relationship with a baby. Does that fill anybody else up or is it just me? I, I mean, being, I love smelling babies. You guys know what I'm talking about? You're like, can I hold them real quick? All right, you can have them back. It's a thing. I don't know what it is. It like fills up my battery. Um, if I think about, um, actually, I reached out to our director, um, Andy, from, from our students at Eden, <clears throat> and she shared with me that we make sure that each student feels seen and safe with each leader. <clears throat> Having them connected to multiple people, including their peers, helps them to feel at home. We have students who came with friends in the past who now come on their own. Isn't that wild? That's a place of permanence, right? This is now saying, hey, this is a space for me. This is a place that I can come back to. In community life, through Pastor Chizu, regular spaces for gatherings, people you can build with over time, setting up community groups. I mean, there's community groups that have been meeting for decades here. Not just weeks, right? It's not a six-week community group. We're talking about people basically a lifetime gathering together and going through all those things of life together. Sunday gather gatherings, we have this space dedicated to worship. It's something that's comfortable. Everybody looks like you're nice and relaxed right now. It's welcoming. It's easy to know that, that you'll be here. And this is a space for you. Our name tags, I just took mine off real quick because I, I transferred. Bob Dahlstedt, make sure I transfer every time I change. I'm sorry, Bob. My bad. I forgot it today. But uh, what about our rose garden out front? Right? A rose garden, is, it, that's, that's there. It's established. It's a thing that's going to help us to remember people that have passed on. What about at the Chabot? What about the Chabot Theater and the legacy of the space there? Right? I mean, it's, it's a historical monument in this community, and you, church, help to keep that alive. Small town society. What about them? They got the clinic over here. Castro Valley High School space that they're creating to be able to do the lab. It's a place for artists to come, to build, to do work. Stack Life. Uh, Stack Life is, is the uh, faith community that I'm building at South Harry Parish as part of the shelter. And what we have there is the tree. And if you've seen any of the photos that I post, we're always underneath the tree. And that tree is where we put the table and it guards us from the sun and, and the heat. And it guards us from the rain when it's raining outside. And it's where we gather. It's the space. It's a sacred space for folks. The second mark of a home is it's a dwelling place. A home is not just a place of permanence, for a home is not the same as a house. A house is a domicile, while a home is a dwelling. A house is a building, whereas a home is an abode. A home is made of memories and stories, and relationships. A home is a place filled with psychological resonance and social significance. <clears throat> this is an interesting fact that they talk about is that a home cannot be bought or sold. It's not for sale. It cannot be commodified. This is why indigenous Hawaiians have advocated for a richer approach to homelessness than just shelters and public housing. It's something called ohana housing, where it's composed of people. So it's not just the physical space, but it's actually groups of people gathered around somebody who's struggling with homelessness to create that community. Ohana means family. And it's a space where they, that's the actual approach they make is, is a native, more indigenous way of doing that. I think it's one of the things that we actually do really well here is to care for people as people. You know, I've had, I've had people say that they've had great experiences here. 
We have folks that have integrated into other ministries here that are in our shelter, but that's not defining them. That just happens to be a place they lay their head temporarily while we're working on getting them something long term. I'm excited to have this community that a community is not just us with levels, but we're all on the same level coming together. And that's, that's a definition of home for me. If you think about HGG and First Pres Kids, spaces, they have spaces designed for kids to hang out and just be kids. It's designed for kids. It's got the little toilets. You guys know what I'm talking about? It's got the little chairs, the ones that you smack your shins on. Students of Eden said they've got comfortable furniture, lots of food and drinks for any diets. We purposely buy drinks that go fast and stop buying things that they don't want. Amen. Provide activities for introverts and extroverts, and there's a no pressure to participate in any activity. There's even a little space that, you guys seen it on the video, that's an introvert don't bug me zone. Fam, that's what young people need. Let's just face it, we were all awkward at that age, right? <laughs> it's not just me. I thought everybody else was awkward, but it was actually me being the awkward one. But we got to create spaces for that. In community life, we got community groups meeting in places that are familiar, comfortable, breaking bread together. My wife and I, we call our, our, our community group the bread breakers because uh, we only meet around food. I promise you that. It's the thing that brings us together. It's the thing that we do. Sunday gatherings, our meet and greet time. Our meet and greet time, fam, like one of the most difficult things to do up here as an MC is stop you from talking to each other. We don't want you to stop. We want it to keep going. But we also hear the complaints when we go past 12. I'll just say that. But what about the snack time outside? What about the fact that those snacks are being created by guests in the shelter that are doing the kitchen club, and they're helping to put those out for you, and they're a part of the community in a different way? At the Chabot, it's a place that we get to see the first run film, our first run favorite films. Last week, um, there was a local sponsor who actually paid to send all of the guests in the shelter to go see Black Adam at the movie theater. It was a beautiful moment, y'all. You should have seen folks when we walk in and smell butter on the popcorn, get their own soda. I tried to interrupt people in the middle of it, and there was, this is the look I got. They were just focused on the film, right? People are still telling me today, hey, that film was amazing. It was so good for us to do that. Some people are saying they hadn't been in a theater in over 10 years. But that's a dwelling place. Small Town, the lab, is, is, a, is an event that they do each month where artists just come together, share, do expression, work on things. I mean, you might be working on a project that's not prime time yet, but it's something that you want to run by other artists. It's a safe space. Stack Life. We focus on, on meeting basic needs first before we talk about anything. We want to make sure everybody's eating. We want to make sure Richard got his third cup of coffee because he's not good at talking until his third cup of coffee. <laughs> but we want to make sure that people have, have been able to eat. People have had their shower for the day. And then we earn the right to sit down and talk with people, right? If we're able to have that home type feeling. Third, Home is a storied place. Homemaking transforms space into place. Homemaking transforms space into place. It endows a place with meaning. Brueggemann argues that place is space which has historical meanings, where some things have happened which are now remembered and which provide continuity and identity across generations. It's space in which important words have been spoken. It's where people have envisioned their own destinies. It becomes a home when it's transformed by memory-shaped meaning into that place of identity, connectedness, order, and care. Now, I think about for me, I have this one little hook that I want to put my keys on when I come inside in a place I put my wallet, right? There's, there's order, right? There's care to it. There's a, there's a routine we go through, right? We got a balance. I, for my, my family and I, we lived in a house for seven years. I've got a wife and three children, and we lived in a house for seven years with one bathroom. 
And uh, that's a challenge. But it was the order and the care. We were able to care for ourselves. We had this order. Everybody worked it out, depending on where you got to go and what you got to do. Shower time here, you know? All these kinds of things. But those are the things that make a place an actual home. The mortar which holds the impoverished home together, even for a child, is memory. To the underprivileged, home is represented not by a house, but by a set of practices. Home is no longer a dwelling, but the untold story of a life being lived. The meaning-making practices and stories have to do with rituals. Hmm. It's one of the things I'm learning about this community. You know, being a part of this church family, I'm starting to learn about some of the rituals that we have, some of the ways that we do things. There's, there's an organization to thing. It brings around that safe space. Some of the things that, that happen in our homes are house warmings, spring cleaning, holiday dinners, Easter and Christmas, births, celebration of births. We have a birth in our family recently, birthdays, weddings and funerals. All of these events with their ritual practices generate stories and thus provide meaning that turns a physical house into an actual home. HGG and First Prez, they, they do date nights once a month, right? Amen to that, parents? But that's, if you think about it, it's outside of the school where the kids are hanging out again. It's outside of Sunday morning where the kids are remembering things together. And they'll have those memories. I, parents of littles, if you ever have a kid coming home and saying something, you're like, I didn't teach them that. They got it from there. Um, Students at Eden says... We plan out youth nights, but if something more, more important is going on, we throw out the plan and make space to be present with our students. Wouldn't you guys rather that, rather than just forcing through with an agenda or a program? When God says turn right, be able to turn right. We celebrate birthdays every two months. When students are new, they fill out a new person card that asks their favorite treat, so when it's their birthday time, we've got their favorite treat. That's a homemaking practice. A ritual is when Andy drives students home and they scream songs out the window only to turn it down right before they arrive at their parents' house. Is that accurate representation? Excellent. <laughs> through community life, the many life events we go through with our community group partners, the meals, the time to help, help each other through it all. I know some of the hardest things I've been through have happened the day before I've had a community group. Been able to spend time with them talk it through, and they know me as a person. It's a beautiful thing to have folks that you can, you can build that community with. Sunday, Sunday gatherings, we have celebrations of holidays coming up. We do our sacraments that we're going to do today, studying of God's word together. I mean, that's grounding. Those are story-making items. At the Chabot, rather than a corporate theater, they focus on local events, local food, local drinks, unique indie films. So it's a place that is storied. Um, at small town, time together, creating music, but just being together. And I'll tell you guys, Paul, Paul kind of does that better than most, just being present with people. And that space is just such a, a rich environment for the artists that get to spend time in there. In Stack Life, we celebrate birthdays. Um, we celebrate holidays. Um, and we do memorials on a regular basis. It's one of the things that, that we've realized is that in memorials, and I've talked about it here several times, is that it's not necessarily the person who passed now that, we're, that we were in, in relationship with, but sometimes it's folks that we have not been able to mourn, and we're still carrying around that pain and that trauma because we haven't been able to work through that. So creating those memorial times is a way for us to have a storied place. Fourth, home is a safe resting place. It's a refuge an asylum of safety and security. Home is where one can be relaxed and at ease rather than tense and anxious. A secure and familiar base from which people explore their world physically and psychologically, and to which they return for rest, regeneration, and a sense of self-identity. I know for me, no matter what else happens out in life, you know, so I can have a really rough day, and sometimes I just got to tell myself, at least my family loves me. I got to get to my family, I get back to my house, and I can get back to center. 
right? I have this game I play with the blocks on my phone. It's like, you know what I mean? There's like this ritual that I have and I get to do that. I have the beauty of having a home to do that and a family to return to. Bruce Cockburn sings, make me a bed of fond memories. Make me to lie down with a smile. Home is a place constructed in such a way that we're safe to rest. And in the shelter, it's one of the most important things that we focus on every single day, every single night, is that everyone that is laying down has protected time to sleep, to rest, and to be able to lower the cortisol levels. It's a beautiful thing, fam. But, you know, at first when we, we were dealing with the, there was a lot of time issues that we had before and weren't able to get in people till after 9 o'clock and there was just, all, it was rough. But getting people in at 6.30, we're finding some people laying down at 7 o'clock at night and sleeping all the way through the night. And that's our job is to create that safety, that space. If you think about HGG and First Press Kids, how they do that, I mean, do I need to say more? They get nap time, y'all. The kids get to take naps, but a kid will not take a nap if they're, if they're overstimulated, right? If they don't feel safe, if they're upset, they don't feel comfortable. Students at Eden, Andy says, the leaders pray over the students before youth night. They check in with youth leaders to see how they are and spend time with them before youth night to make sure they feel seen and received before they carry the weight of leading others. It's a powerful practice. It's proven to build all of our, uh, all of our connection. The students are amazing. I feel like they have their own little politics and make the space what it is. I think God creates a safe resting place for all of us that dwell in Students of Eden. When you say come as you are, it's bound to get messy, but we work through it and find our way back to health and wholeness. I think we all wanted that when we were youth, right? The depth at community life, the depth of the relationships that are formed through groups, through the classes. Um, you know, I see the Spanish class that we have going on over here all the time. That's such a beautiful thing that, I mean, that is a community group, fam. It just happens to be around Spanish. And I mean, it's even between languages. And now that, that gap between languages is getting smaller and smaller. It's a beautiful thing. Sunday gatherings, this space, this time, these moments of reflection that we get to have in here, the ability to leave the worries and the stresses of our life here, our name tags, right? We get to know each other's names. I mean, it only takes me about seven or eight times. I'm sorry if I get you with the wrong name. I'll keep practicing. But say them out loud. I got a trick. You say it out loud in your head three times. But I mean, not out loud. In your head, three times. Not, you got what I meant. But it works. The Chabot, it, it's, a, it's a place for you to step away from the fast-paced world into a relaxed space. Sometimes a space of imagination. Sometimes a space where you get to see heroes, sometimes a space where you just get to leave your worries behind. Small town, you know, small town society, I've seen artists in here all hours of the night. I get, you know, I can tell you our security guards, our safety ambassadors, they'll post, we've got people in the clinic playing drums, <laughs> you know, practicing music. It's a safe space where people can go. Stack life. You know, thinking about this at Stack Life, I think it's the prayer time at the end. You know, we're, we're, we're creating a space of faith for people that, that necessarily don't feel safe or comfortable in other faith communities. One of the cool things is when at the end I go around and I ask every single person if they have a prayer request. Very rarely does anybody say no. And almost always their prayer request is for other people. That's a beautiful thing. It's, it's one of the things that has changed me over the years here is seeing that and seeing how people are connected and what people are saying is that they want God to intervene on behalf of others. And I think it, it's a certain level of safety when people can start to begin to ask for true, honest things for themselves. And we're starting to get there. People are asking for help with their anger. People are asking for help with the challenges with their family. There's a lot of trust that comes with that. Last week, Pastor Christmas talked to us about Luke 10. And uh, in there, the person that was trying to quiz Jesus said, okay, Jesus, who is my neighbor? 
And I want us to think about that as Greg comes up and he's going to play a little music for us as we reflect today. But I'd ask us, who is our neighbor? Who is God calling each one of you to serve through your work here at First Press? We've gone through a lot of our different ministries that we have going on, and maybe there's ministries in people's minds that God's put on your heart. I know there's tons of different things that are on our hearts. But I'd like for us to ask that question, who is my neighbor? As we think about, if you guys wouldn't mind just praying with me, we're going to think about the first four marks of home. And I'd like to ask each one of you while we pray, think about in what ways do I need permanence? What ways do I need dwelling? What ways do I need a storied place? What ways do I need a safe resting place? God, would you reveal to us as we pray, can you show us what ways we can help to create a place of permanence for others, God? What ways can we create a dwelling place for others, Lord? What ways can we create a story place for others? What ways can we create a safe resting place for others? God, I pray that you would help us to be placemakers of permanence for my neighbors, for our neighbors. Help us to define by your definition who our neighbors are. Help us to be placemakers of dwelling space for our neighbors. Help us to be placemakers of storied and memory-making spaces for our neighbors. Help us to be placemakers of safe resting space for our neighbors. God, help each one of us to find permanence, dwelling, storied, and safe resting spaces so that we can return to the version of ourselves that you created us to be.